out of rest. Greetings, I'm Shad, and in this episode of Medieval Misconceptions, we're going to be looking at a howler, and that's the uh, perception of literacy in the medieval period, because clearly everyone was uneducated, surely, okay? And they didn't know how to read. First off, there should be a bit of a distinction between uneducated and being literate, because you can be literate and still be uneducated in varying fields. And the other thing that needs to be mentioned is Education, okay, in what way? To what level of education should you expect? And what's the threshold for one to be considered educated or uneducated? Because in regards to the jobs that most of the average medieval person needed to fulfill, they uh, obviously would have become competent enough to fulfill those tasks. And especially if they get a trade, okay, if they're a tile maker, if they're a leather worker, if they're a weaver, if they're a blacksmith, if they're a woodworker, if they're a carpenter, if they're an architect, if they're a candle maker, if they're a wainwright, okay? I, the, the list goes on and on and on and on and on, okay? Whatever craft that they're gonna be doing, they'll at least know enough about the craft to be able to perform it, and they're educated in the realms that they need to fulfill. And then there are just everyday kind of uh, like jobs and tasks that you'd need to fulfill that it seems like was done on a more individual basis, like uh, food storage, food preparation, things like that, medieval versions of hygiene, like what, what hygiene? Um, by the way, I should, you know, give it, it's high time I give this channel a shout out. And it's uh, Modern History TV, uh, focusing directly on the medieval period. They make great videos, really good stuff. And uh, what I love about him, he also likes to look at more kind of very specific areas of the medieval period. And the context why this relates to this one is made a video on one of the ways medieval people might have washed their hands. Uh, um, there was a very ample resource that break, breaks down oils um, and fats and, and messy stuff that you get on your hands quite well, and it's Ash, and he made a whole video sharing that. So uh, I'll link that video, check it out in the description. Brilliant channel, comes with my high recommendation. And so there are many, many aspects of the medieval period that obviously were done on different levels in terms of what was considered clean and unclean, because medieval people, they certainly had an idea of what was clean and unclean, but oftentimes they did get, they, they, missed, they mistook it, okay? And so one of the um, uh, uh, things that I've learned, and again, one of the thing, big prominent um, things I want always like to emphasize in these medieval misconception videos is that whatever I say, generally, it's hard to pinpoint how specific or widespread these practices were. Like this next anecdote I'm about to share, uh, I don't think it uh, applied to the whole medieval period, and I don't even know the period it came from, um, but it was about uh, medieval table manners, and one of the things that was considered very uh, rude and dirty was scratching your face, because a lot of the food was communally grabbed, and scratching your face and, then, and grabbing something like that, that was really dirty. You don't touch your face when you're, you're grabbing your food. Uh, so uh, small things like that, they indicate a much broader or uh, applicable kind of understanding of certain practices like hygiene. They were aware of these things, okay? But there are a lot of things that they didn't understand. They had no concept of germ theory, okay? And so uh, because of that, germ transferal happened a lot. By the way, they did bathe, all right? Medieval bathhouses were quite prominent in the medieval period, and there are only certain areas in the medieval period when bathing might have been either done differently or done less, that it seems like that was then applied more broadly. And, they, and people like to take a lot of things from the Victorian period and apply it on the medieval period. What are we talking about? Literacy, that, that's, that's literacy, that's right. Uh, we, okay, getting back to it, all right? But this is all related tangentially to what I was talking about, because again, it seems like, People misunderstand certain contexts or conditions and then apply it too broadly to the whole medieval period and then they're all illiterate. And, uh, and so, first off, when I'm f finishing off my ramblings about education, people were educated in the things they needed to do and the jobs they needed to perform. And to me, that strikes me as a fairly competent level of education. Then, and it's funny, people like also then try and apply things that is common knowledge to us now to the medieval period, and then they must be uneducated in that regard, but they didn't even know it. How can they? And so education in terms of if you're educated or not should be based upon the knowledge and the academia, you know, that existed in the period, not here, like germ theory. We don't know about germ theory. So obviously they're uneducated about germ theory in the medieval period, uh, but, 
that was completely absent. And so it wasn't the fact that there was something that they could have learned that didn't, and therefore they were uneducated, it just wasn't even there. So stop applying standards from the modern time onto the medieval period. That's the important thing. And so when you look at the medieval period in context, what did they know out of the information that was available? Obviously, people aren't stupid. Medieval people weren't stupid. They're actually really smart, and they came up with really inventive kind of ways to solve problems that they had. Now, the process of invention is always different between different time periods and things, and so it, it gets affected um, as to how many people are working at a certain task and stuff like that. And uh, sometimes, it, it, like, you just need that moment of inspiration from that one individual, uh, and then it can kick off an entire technological field, like how we discovered radio accidentally. Um, I forget who did it, but anyway, it was basically an accident, essentially. And so with a lower population, it's less likely that those small little key points happened or at least happened at a slower rate. But the things that they did try and solve in regards to the problems that existed, oftentimes are really clever and really inventive. And so these aren't dumb people. And, and when it comes to common tasks or jobs they need to perform, you can bet you're absolutely, they're going to try and learn about it and be able to do it competently and improve upon it. The, the, the quality standards that started to arise in the medieval period amongst certain trades which, all, again, reflects high amounts of education and stuff. Really high, like, um, gr great series, uh, How to Build a Castle. It's a series that um, goes through Getalon, and, uh, and they have all these tangential kind of crafts that, crafts that they branch out to, and then they share these, this great information on. One of the things that they were sharing in this uh, documentary series was the quality control that was made on, on the tiles. The tiles were made out of clay, and it was really high. There was a very high standard that people of that trade were expected to achieve, all right? And so they are, you know, like needing it to a certain amount to make sure there weren't any air pockets to you know, have the right strength and stuff like that so there would be durability. Like, and so quality control in, in the crafts of the medieval period was actually, like guilds, whole guilds were, you know, formed, not over the whole medieval period, okay? But guilds became prominent in Germany, for one, medieval Germany, I know, uh, specifically, and a lot of other areas, but they arose for one to help you know maintain quality control but there are a lot of other things guilds are a very interesting subject I mean, whole video on them okay but to dispel this myth of being uneducated there's uh, so many things that you can see that indicate that these are these are smart people and they worked at educating themselves to a very high level of competency for what they needed all right now Going to uh, literature specifically. The question that needs to be asked about how literates were medieval people was, uh, again, when and where and what language, all right? There was a lot of different languages. Now, in this video, we're primarily going to be focusing on French and English because it's the interrelation between these two languages that created the misconception of medieval illiteracy. The other important thing that you need to understand about this period is that in most regions, there were multiple dialects of the same language. There wasn't one unified French language. If you look at the Germanic regions in the early Middle Ages, there was Upper German, Low Saxon, Central German, Highest Alemannic, and Northern Low Saxon. All of these languages are considered Germanic, but they're hardly intelligible between one another. This is the same with the early forms of medieval Italian. There was no unified Italian language. In fact, there were many different local dialects that are just generally referred to as vulgar Latin, but this shouldn't be confused with proper Latin of the period. The more formal written language of this period was Latin, and if you couldn't read and write in Latin, you were probably considered illiterate in that sense, even if you most likely could read and write in your own local language. And this applies to the whole of medieval Europe. The more prevalent languages of uh, certain medieval periods, like if you go to early medieval period, okay, uh, French and Latin, okay? Very important languages, and so if you're going to be looking for the language that was considered uh, the language that is more likely for someone else to know so you can communicate with them, you'll be looking at something like French or Latin. And medieval French, of course, is different to modern French, just like medieval English. And we'll come to English as well, because this is where I think the misconception arises, in all honesty. Uh, so we're getting there. But if you wanted the language that had high chance of someone to know, those languages you would resort to. And if they're, and they're basically, like French, in, for instance, was basically the for a very long period, Period, was the language of the nobility. Uh, of course, people in France spoke French, but if you go to England, all right, the English nobility, most of them were French, okay, and they spoke French, and it was only Henry V 
who actually decided, like he chose, we're speaking English. I'm speaking English, we're speaking English to the court to flex the, the people, all right? <laughs> My people, essentially. Before then, it's all French, okay? And if, uh, and if you look at England, so this is where we're getting into the context of where this idea of literacy comes from. If this is the language of the higher ups and stuff like that, the, the important people and everything, if that's your standard, okay, that uh, French is the, the standard language, most of the people in England are going to be illiterate in French, absolutely. They might be able to say a couple of words here and there, but then read and write French? First, how much of a need would they have to even be able to um, read and write French? Latin was basically the language of uh, religion of the time, okay? Uh, masses often were held in Latin. Um, with differences, but Bible usually always written in Latin and stuff. And so if literacy was considered being able to read the Bible, well, barely anyone's going to be literate, are they, in that context? And I think that would even apply to like mainland France and Germany, uh, Spain, and like there's a lot of areas all in the medieval period that all gets into one. And this is probably the most significant point to consider. The most important book by far of this period was the Bible, and the Bible was always written in Latin. And therefore, it's easy to see that this was the gold standard of true literacy of the medieval period. It's the most important book. It's the main academic language. This is what most books would be written in, and officially the greatest book of all, always in Latin. It was even considered heresy to translate it into other languages. Pope Innocent III in 1199 even banned unauthorized versions of the Bible completely. Though alternate unofficial translations of the Bible did appear here and there throughout Europe, they were often suppressed and those who translated them punished. It was only after the medieval period and the Reformation movement that alternate translations of the Bible actually started to become common. And so regardless of where you lived, whether it was in England, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Scandinavia, or anywhere, if you could not read the Bible, the most important book, that was considered illiterate. Even if you could read and write in your own local language. And people generally, and I think this is due to the English speaking language, when they try and and get a build a picture of the medieval period they look to what is related to them what's familiar with their language okay medieval england is generally the go-to like first starting location and i do this too okay i mean i'm guilty of this too and then they look at the condition of medieval england and then apply it to all of the medieval period in every location and there's a whole you know mainland europe thing happening in the medieval time as well and they apply all of the conditions that existed then over the rest of the continent so no, that shouldn't be done, and I think this is where the misconception does, because when it comes to French and Latin, most of the English people would be completely illiterate in those languages, with only a few exceptions, so therefore everyone in the medieval period was illiterate. No. Okay, no. We have letters in, you know, uh, like medieval England, written in English, sent from peasants to peasants, okay? We got letters, we got land rights and everything like that. We have a lot of evidence indication that these people could read English. All right? And so when it comes to literacy rates of the most common language that they would know, the, the estimates are very hard to nail down. Having looked into this, it seems the, the, the conservative minimum estimate, this is the conservative, I think it's a lot higher than this, was d uh, definitely like at least one person per household could read and write, and it seems to be much higher, all right? And at least 50% amongst the population, if not higher. And that's not an illiterate society, far from it, okay? And so this idea that the medieval people were both uneducated and illiterate is a, uh, it's a pervasive myth that needs to be, like, completely just, uh, get rid of, dispel it, and hence the reason of this video. Um, reading and writing is useful. You know, you can actually send information via with symbols uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, recorded on some type of transportable material, uh, stone or parchment or whatever, to another person. That's a really useful thing. You think the average peasant isn't going to want to be able to use that? I mean, my goodness. I mean, there, there's like even stuff written by peasantry, I think. Like, um, uh, this, uh, most of the written, like when it comes to books, it's late in the medieval period. But um, uh, there's like a how to farm book that's written in, you know, um, uh, by a farmer. This is a nobility, okay, uh, farming practices of medieval times and stuff. I know there's a medieval cookbook, which became like one of the, like, you know, first bestseller thing. Um, uh, 
but I can't remember if that was like nobility or cook, but a cook is not like an actual noble. He, I think he served nobility and that is a higher up position, but it was written down. Look at that writing, okay? And, and the book became so popular. How could it become so popular if no one could read? So of course people could read. I mean, if you're gonna write something down, it's with the expectation that people can get ahead of it and read it and figure out <laughs> so, this idea that everyone was literally could read. It's, it's very contradicted by so many points of evidence. And so now I think, you know, look, I'm a rambler, all the tangents, they were, they were related tangents, okay? They help contextualize things, they're worth it. I'm, I'm holding on to that. Um, but that, that, that's kind of it, that, that, so thank you for watching. I think we've, uh, we've uh, uh, you know, addressed this subject more, far more detailed than is necessary, but that's what I do because, you know, tangents. Uh, there, so I hope you have enjoyed. I hope we've uh, learned something and, uh, and of course I hope to see you again. So until that time,